Okay, we're gonna start off by palpating some structures of the shoulder girdle, starting at the manubrium and the jugular notch here. So the jugular notch is the top of the manubrium, and the uh, lateral side of the manubrium articulates with this medial end of the clavicle right here. So this, this is the distal end of the clavicle, and this forms the SC joint, or the sternoclavicular joint. I can then follow the clavicle all the way out, past this convex surface, and into this concave surface. You can see how that uh, bends right there at the clavicle. So I can follow that clavicle all the way out to the distal end. And on a lot of people, you can visualize the distal end of the clavicle because it sticks up off the shoulder just a little bit. So you can see the distal end of the clavicle right here. That distal end of the clavicle articulates with the acromion process right here. The acromion process is this very flat portion of bone right here uh, on the lateral side of the shoulder. So if you if you go to the distal end of the clavicle and just drop off there, you should feel a very flat portion of bone that goes all the way back and you can feel it take a turn right here. There should be a little uh, corner of the acromion process back here that you can almost stick your finger under and you can follow that up all the way to the anterior surface of the shoulder. So this articulation between the clavicle and the acromion process is the AC joint or the acromioclavicular joint. And that's the joint that gets separated uh, uh, when someone falls on the shoulder or in athletics a lot. So if we continue to follow the acromion process back, the acromion process becomes the spine of the scapula. So those are continuous with each other. So here's that flat portion of the acromion process. I can follow that back. And if I use the palm of my hand or my finger pads, I can roll back and forth over the top of that spine of the scapula. And I can follow that spine of the scapula all the way back to the medial border of the scapula. So we can keep going this way, medially, and eventually I'll drop off this onto that medial border of the scapula going down right here. And that spine of the scapula comes all the way from the acromion process to the medial border here. So once I've reached the medial border of the scapula, I can have the patient uh, do some things like put the arm behind the back and that exposes that medial border a little bit more and I can palpate all the way up and down that medial border of the scapula. If I go superiorly along that medial border of the scapula, I'll end up right up here at the superior angle of the scapula. So that's where the scapula comes up and takes a turn right here. So right there, I can palpate that superior angle, and then I can also follow that medial border down all the way to the inferior angle of the scapula down here. So. It comes down, there's the inferior angle, and then I can follow that lateral border all the way up to that glenohumeral joint. So there's the lateral border of the scapula there. Okay, if we come out on the lateral surface of the shoulder right here, we have that acromion process that we've mentioned before. And if we drop just off that lateral side of the shoulder right there, off that acromion process, we end up underneath that acromion process, there's a little space called the subacromial space and there's also a bursa that sits underneath there. But this subacromial space is important because we have tendons of the rotator cuff that uh, come underneath the acromion process and attach to the greater tuberosity out here on the humerus. And uh, that space in there is for a lot of those rotator cuff tendons that attach to the, uh, that pull the glenohumeral joint together. So if we come out on this anterior, anterior lateral surface of the shoulder, the most uh, anterior and lateral projection right there is usually where you're going to find the greater tuberosity. So if I use the palm of my hand and just roll it along that anterolateral surface, you'll feel a little outcrop of bone pushing into your hand, and that is the greater tuberosity right there. So the greater tuberosity, again, is an insertion site for some important muscles, including the supraspinatus, which is a rotator cuff muscle. The greater tuberosity also forms that lateral border of the intertubercular groove that has the biceps tendon running through it right here. So if I palpate this greater tuberosity, you can see the biceps tendon rolling under my finger right there. But if you find that greater tuberosity, then by default you found the biceps tendon. If I go a little further medially, then I can fill another little uh, outcrop of bone called the lesser tuberosity. So we have the lesser tuberosity and the greater tuberosity that form that groove, uh, the intertubercular groove where the biceps tendon sits, that proximal biceps tendon. If I go a little further anteriorly, then I'll run into the coracoid process right here. 
The coracoid process is an anterior projection off of the scapula, and it usually sits right under that concavity in the clavicle right here. So if, if I palpate deep in that concavity and then move laterally, I'll run into the medial border of that coracoid process, and that's very easily palpable and very tender on most people if you push on it. So that serves as the origin uh, or the insertion for several muscles, including the coracobrachialis and the pectoralis uh, minor and the short head of the biceps. Okay, we're also going to palpate the deltoid tuberosity. So the deltoid tuberosity is a projection laterally off of the humerus that serves as the insertion point for the deltoid. So we have the anterior deltoid, the middle deltoid, and the posterior deltoid all converging about halfway down the humerus on this little outcrop of bone. So if we have the patient abduct the arm just a little bit, you can see those deltoid muscles coming together right here and inserting on that deltoid tuberosity. And you should be able to palpate a little outcrop of bone, a little projection of bone right there. Okay, we can also uh, get a hold of the uh, proximal glenohumeral joint or in the, in the proximal head of the humerus. The best way I like to do this is to find that greater tuberosity again. So use the palm of the hand, find that greater tuberosity, that's right there. And then I'll take my thumb and I'll roll off the back of the acromion. So the acromion right here takes a little turn right here and just under the back side of that acromion, you can almost push underneath there and get a hold of the back side of the humerus and then get a hold of that greater and lesser tuberosity anteriorly and then you can get a good hold of the shoulder and this is helpful for some of the special tests you'll do um, in the shoulder later on so you can feel the front and the back side of that uh, humeral head there okay from the back side we're going to take a look at some of the muscles of the back and of the shoulder girdle here so we'll start with the upper trap so the upper trapezius muscle um, originates at the external occipital protuberance and from C1 all the way down to C7 here. So if we have the patient shrug the shoulders up, you should be able to visualize those upper trap muscles. Go ahead and relax and get a hold of those upper trap muscles. And these upper trap muscles come all the way down to the distal end of the clavicle and some of the acromion process right here. So we can get a hold of these upper trap muscles and you can actually follow some of those upper trap muscles and put your fingers on the anterior side of those upper trap muscles and follow that all the way up into the cervical spine right there in a lot of individuals. So that's the most superficial layer of muscle overlying the neck and, and some of the upper back and shoulder right here. So uh, similar to the upper trap muscle, we've also got the levator scapulae. Uh, as its name indicates, this muscle helps to elevate the scapula. And so if we find that superior uh, angle of the scapula again, we can follow that medial border of the scapula all the way up to that superior angle right there and that muscle comes right off that superior angle so if you push deeply there that should be pretty tender on most patients and uh, the levator scapulae comes off the transverse processes of c1 to c4 and goes up under the neck there so it lies underneath the trap muscle and sometimes you can palpate the levator scapulae anteriorly if we come on this anterior side of the trapezius and push uh, have the patient side bend the neck a little bit uh, to put that upper trapezius and uh, the levator scapulae on slack. Then you can push into that upper trap and really uh, get deeply there and palpate the anterior surface of that levator scapulae muscle. Okay, we've also got the middle trapezius and that uh, goes from T1 down to T4 here. Uh, that's where its origin is, and then it's got insertion sites on the spine of the scapula and the acromion process here. So if we have the patient uh, bring the, the arms out and then pull the shoulder blades back together, that should, uh, and especially if the, if the humerus is an external rotation, that should activate that middle trap muscle. So go ahead and relax. So going from T1 to T4 and out uh, that way, it's that most superficial layer of muscle on the back right there. And then we've got the rhomboid major going from T1 to T4, from right here, T1 to T4, and going to that medial border of the scapula right here. But that sits underneath that middle trap muscle. If we have the patient uh, squeeze the shoulder blades together again, but this time an in internal rotation, that will activate the rhomboids more, and then external rotation will activate the middle traps more. Okay, and then we've also got the lower trapezius muscle, which
uh, runs from T5 down to T12. And the action of that muscle is to move the scapula down. So if we uh, have the patient get in this Y position, we can get this inferior movement of the scapula right here and we can see those muscle bellies coming and converging down here near T12. So if we give them some resisted uh, shoulder flexion there, we should be able to make those pop out and feel those right there. Okay, now we've also got the supraspinatus muscle. The supraspinatus muscle, just as it sounds, sits above the spine of the scapula. So if we use our finger pads and palpate the spine of the scapula and roll over the top of that spine, we'll be palpating through the upper trap, but we can palpate down that supraspinous fossa and follow that supraspinatus muscle all the way out. Right about here, we got the convergence of the clavicle and the acromion process, and the tendon of that supraspinatus muscle is gonna roll, uh, project underneath the acromion process all the way to that greater tuberosity or that greater tubercle. Okay, we've also got the infraspinatus right here, uh, just opposite of the supraspinatus. If we find the spine of the scapula and roll inferiorly on this posterior surface of the scapula, the infraspinatus takes up most of this posterior surface of the scapula. So if you push into the posterior surface of the scapula on this infraspinous fossa, you should be able, you should be pushing into uh, palpating through some trapezius muscle and pushing into that infraspinatus muscle. If we have the patient actively externally rotate the humerus, you can see that muscle contract right there. Go ahead and relax now. And then one more time, you can see that muscle contract right there. That's your infraspinatus. Okay, we've got the teres minor also. So the teres minor is another rotator cuff muscle that sits on the lateral border of the scapula. So here's our inferior angle. I can follow that lateral border of the scapula all the way up toward the glenohumeral joint. If I have the patient externally rotate the arm again, this muscle is an external rotator and it sits on the upper two thirds of that lateral border of the scapula and you should be able to feel that contract right there. So that's the infraspinatus. And then the teres minor sits just under. So if I have the patient externally rotate the humerus, you should be able to feel that teres minor contract right there on the lateral border of the scapula. Just under the teres minor, we have the teres major that also originates on the lateral border of the scapula, but it inserts on the uh, anterior humerus near the inner tubercular groove. And uh, if we have the patient put his arm behind his back here, all the way back here, and then give some resisted elbow extension, uh, you, can, you can usually see a little bubble contract right there on, now relax here. Bring it right there, now push back again. You can see that little bubble kind of contract right there. That's the uh, teres major muscle. And then we also have the latissimus dorsi. So the latissimus dorsi is one of the larger muscles in the body. It aids in uh, shoulder extension and shoulder adduction. So uh, it originates down here on the thoracolumbar lumbar fascia and the iliac crest and from uh, T7 down to T12 and it comes up and its tendon inserts on the intertubercular groove right there and uh, aids in shoulder extension. So if I resist some shoulder extension, we can see the muscle contracting right there near the axilla and uh, projecting down toward that thoracolumbar fascia down there. We can also do it this way, go ahead and push down into shoulder extension. You can see that lat right there or have the patient push down into the table and you can see a lot of that lat muscle contract right there and feel that, that lat muscle contract there. Okay, so next we're gonna do the pectoralis major. So the pectoralis major has clavicular fibers and it has sternal fibers right here. So uh, it's a fairly large muscle. It helps with shoulder adduction this way. Um, so to activate uh, both sets of fibers, we can just go straight horizontal adduction. Go ahead and contract. You can see those fibers contracting all the way down on the clavicular side and down on the sternal side right here. Um, and we have the tendon coming over to the crest of the greater tubercle right here. So if I wanted to activate um, predominantly uh, clavicular fibers, then I'll put him, put his humerus down and have him go into some shoulder flexion and horizontal adduction right there. And we can really get those uh, clavicular fibers to pop there. And if I wanted to activate predominantly sternal fibers, then I turn his humerus down this way and have him contract down this way. And 
uh, that activates more predominantly the uh, or the sternal fibers right there. Okay, the uh, pectoralis minor is is difficult to palpate, um, but it originates from ribs three to five and inserts on the coracoid process right here. So if I found the coracoid process right here under the clavicle, then I know I'm at least on that superior portion of the pec minor. And what I can do is come up underneath the pec major right here, up in the axilla, and just head toward that uh, coracoid process right there. And then I can have uh, the subject uh, pushed down and activate some of those fibers on the ribs right there, or protract the scapula and I can get those to contract. So that's a more difficult one because you're palpating underneath the pec major, but you can uh, feel, especially up toward the, the coracoid process, you may be able to feel some of those fibers contract. Okay, the serratus anterior muscle is an interesting muscle. It originates from ribs one to nine on the lateral ribs right here and it inserts all the way back here on the medial border of the scapula. So it goes underneath the scapula all the way to this medial border. And when it contracts, it pulls on that medial border of the scapula and causes scapular protraction. So to, to activate this, I'm gonna have the subject sit right here and then protract the scapula forward. And as he does that, you should be able to uh, see and or feel some of those muscle fibers contract on the ribs right here. And they're gonna feel uh, pretty much like ribs to you, but if you if you push down and really give uh, get a, a sense of the end fill, you'll notice that it's a muscular end fill with a hard end fill underneath it. So although these feel like ribs right here, those muscles are going to be sitting right on top of those ribs, and that's why they call it the serratus anterior because it gives a serrated look. Okay, and then we've got the deltoid. We've mentioned this before, but if we put the patient into shoulder abduction, um, we've got three heads of the deltoid, we've got the anterior head, the, media, uh, the middle head, and the posterior uh, portion of the deltoid here. So that means we've also got clavicular fibers here, we've got acromion fibers here, and we have some fibers on the spine of the scapula back here. So those all converge to the deltoid tuberosity, and you can kind of get a sense of activating those different heads by doing different um, movements here. So if we do shoulder flexion, that predominantly activates the uh, anterior head or the anterior portion of the deltoid. If we do lateral, that gets all three heads. And then if we do posterior, we should be able to activate uh, predominantly posterior fibers on that deltoid. Okay, and then lastly, we have the coracobrachialis muscle. So the coracobrachialis muscle is a muscle that goes from the coracoid process here um, down between the bicep and the tricep on the mid shaft of the humerus right here. This one can be difficult to palpate, but if we have the patient uh, get into this position, into some external rotation, and then pull into some shoulder flexion and shoulder ab, uh, adduction, go ahead and pull that way, then sometimes we can feel that muscle right there as it, right there, as it heads toward the coracoid process between the bicep and the tricep. Okay, next we're gonna palpate the shaft of the humerus. So we've already found the head of the humerus here by getting on the uh, greater tuberosity and behind the acromion process. So we can palpate the head of the humerus and then we can work our way down the shaft of the humerus. So you kind of have to work your way between some muscles here, but usually you can uh, palpate through some of that musculature and fill the shaft of the humerus all the way down the lateral side. And we could do the same thing down the medial side between the biceps and the tricep muscles. So you gotta be gentle in here because we have neurovasculature that runs down through here and that can be tender for some patients. But you should be able to get a good sense, especially on this medial side, a good sense of uh, that medial uh, aspect of the shaft of the humerus all the way down. So if we follow the humerus all the way down on the lateral side, there's a spot down here near the elbow where that bone starts to flare out a little bit and form a ridge. That's called the lateral supracondylar ridge. And if we follow that all the way down, we'll uh, run into the lateral epicondyle of the humerus down here. And that serves as the origin for a lot of those forearm extensor muscles.
We can do the same thing on the medial side. We can follow the shaft of the humerus down. And right here, we start to get a little ridge that starts to flare out just a little bit, a sharp little ridge. And if we follow that all the way down, we'll run into the medial epicondyle of the humerus right there. And that serves as a common origin site for a lot of the forearm flexor muscles. Okay, we can also palpate the radial nerve. There are several different places we can palpate the radial nerve. So the radial nerve comes off the brachial plexus and it runs down the posterior aspect of the humerus and crosses right here at the radial groove of the humerus and starts to project more anteriorly. So just underneath the uh, deltoid tuberosity, we have this radial groove in the humerus. And if we, uh, if we roll our fingers up and down, you probably won't get a lot of detail on this nerve, but you should be able to feel, uh, get a sense of a structure that's running in this direction right there, and that's the radial nerve. Okay, we can get the patient into elbow flexion and uh, neutral wrist uh, pronation and supination and activate this brachioradialis muscle. And if I palpate between that brachioradialis muscle right there and that distal biceps tendon right there, we can, we can also palpate the radial nerve deep down in there. So if we roll back and forth, the radial nerve is running this way and heading up the, the shaft of the radius. So we can usually um, roll over the top of that just between that brachioradialis and that distal biceps tendon. Okay, if we follow this all the way down, down on near the styloid process of the radius down here, or even in this anatomical snuff box, we can usually, there's his right there, I can usually roll over the top of that uh, radial nerve right there. I don't know if you can see that rolling under my finger, and Dr. Stevenson can probably feel that. Um, maybe some of that innervation down there. Uh, so the, the nerves are running this way. And if you just roll back and forth across the radius, you should be able to roll over the top of it right there. Okay, if I put Dr. Stevenson in some elbow flexion, there's a little spot right here we call the cubital crease. And that's just where the skin fold is right here at the elbow. That can be useful for helping us find uh, some other structures. So if we go uh, to the lateral side of the uh, humerus here. We've already palpated the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and now I want to palpate the radius. So the shaft of the radius comes all the way up and it articulates with the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. So if I palpate the lateral epicondyle and move just distally, especially if the patient is in some shoulder or some elbow extension, if I palpate just distally to that, I should be able to fill a little joint space right there. And that's the joint space or the articulation between the humerus, that lateral epicondyle, and the radius more distally. So the head of the radius posteriorly is right there. I can put a finger on that and I can actually come anteriorly in this space near the cubital crease and palpate deeply into the cubital crease and I can get a hold of the head of the radius posteriorly and anteriorly and you can actually move it around just a little bit and feel a little bit of joint movement in there. I can also have Dr. Stevenson pronate and supinate his forearm and you should be able to feel the head of that radius spinning underneath your fingers, especially posteriorly. You can feel it turning back and forth right there. Okay, once I've located the, the radial head or the head of the radius, then I can follow the shaft of the radius all the way down toward the thumb. So don't get confused on this. If Dr. Stevenson is in pronation right here, then the radius is coming from laterally and it's actually crossing over the top of the ulna and that can be confusing. So remember, it starts on the later, near the lateral epicondyle and ends near the thumb. So if we supinate here, then it puts the bones in alignment and I've got the radius right here and the ulna right here. So I can palpate all the way down the shaft of that radius, all the way to the wrist where I end up at the radial styloid process, this sharp little piece of bone down here distally just before the wrist. So we can do the same thing with the ulna. So the olecranon process right here is the proximal portion of the ulna. So that's very easily palpable right there. If I palpate that olecranon process and come just proximally here, that olecranon process, when Dr. Stevenson goes into elbow extension, it, uh, it ends up in this little olecranon fossa right here. So 
The olecranon fossa is a portion of the distal humerus that allows that olecranon process to sit inside there during elbow extension. So if he's in elbow flexion right here, then I can really feel uh, that, that olecranon fossa right there. And as I move Dr. Stevenson into elbow extension, that olecranon process moves superiorly and ends up sitting right in that olecranon fossa. So from the olecranon process, I can actually follow that down all the way distally until I get to the ulnar styloid process right here at the wrist. So this ulna, this ulnar shaft from the olecranon process to the styloid process should be completely exposed. So you're not having to palpate through a lot of muscle or soft tissue. It should just be skin and then bone and you can follow that all the way down. And it's kind of got a sharp edge on it and you can palpate uh, transversely across that sharp edge and follow that ulna all the way down. Okay, next we have the radial tuberosity. So the radial tuberosity serves as the insertion for the distal biceps tendon. So if he's in some elbow flexion, some active elbow flexion, I can feel that distal biceps tendon right here. And if I follow that distal biceps tendon deeply all the way down uh, on this uh, lateral side, I should be able to follow that all the way down until I get to the radius. So you have to palpate deeply into the forearm here, just following the lateral edge of that distal biceps tendon all the way down. But you should get to a point where you feel it inserting into that uh, radial tuberosity right there. So from the distal biceps tendon, we can also find a couple of other structures. So uh, here's the distal biceps tendon again. If I come medially this time, uh, and go just underneath, just near the cubital crease and just underneath that biceps tendon, I can roll back and forth and I can usually roll across that median nerve as it crosses the elbow right there. And so you'll have to be gentle with this one, with your palpation, but you should be able to palpate just underneath that biceps tendon, that median nerve. Okay, and if I come just a little more medially, I can usually get a brachial artery right here. So there's Dr. Stevenson's brachial artery. I can feel that pulse just uh, if I had posteriorly from or medially from the distal biceps tendon and toward that uh, medial epicondyle, I can find that brachial artery and that brachial pulse. Okay, and then lastly, more posteriorly, we've already found that uh, medial epicondyle. If I roll over that medial epicondyle between the medial epicondyle and the olecranon process, then we can find the ulnar nerve right there. And you can usually feel the ulnar nerve, if we go just a little more proximal, we can feel that ulnar nerve as it enters that uh, sulcus for the ulnar nerve and usually as it exits right there. So that's what we call the funny bone in lay terms. And that's the ulnar nerve coming under there and heading down the forearm that way. Okay, next we're gonna do the uh, some of the muscles of the arm and the forearm. So we'll start with the biceps brachii muscle right here. If we have the patient just hold uh, in active elbow flexion right there, that'll activate the biceps brachii muscles. So this is two, two muscles, that's why they call it the biceps. It has two heads. One head, the long head goes, uh, has a tendon that projects up into the, inf or the supraglenoid tubercle. And the short head of the biceps uh, has a tendon that projects to the coracoid process right here. So uh, we can get a hold of the biceps and follow it all the way up. And we can actually work our way between those biceps muscles here, right there. I can, I can kind of split those biceps muscles, especially as I come more proximally. And I can split between that lateral side, which is the long head, and that medial side, which is the short head right here. I can also follow the biceps down to that distal biceps tendon. So those, those two mu muscle bellies converge to form the distal biceps tendon. And I can follow that distal biceps tendon all the way deep into the forearm as it attaches to the radial head right there. If I follow that distal biceps tendon medially, that fans out and becomes the bicipital eponeurosis, which covers those uh, medial forearm muscles right there. So the edge of the distal biceps tendon is right there, and I can feel the edge of it as it starts to fan out, and I can follow that all the way down and across the forearm. Okay, next we have the tricep muscles. So if I have the patient just push down with a fist into the, into the table here, right there, there you go. Then we have three heads of the triceps. We have 
the long head that's that's actually the most medial that long head goes all the way up into the infraglenoid tubercle of the shoulder so it crosses both the elbow and the shoulder making it a two joint muscle so there's the uh, long head if i move laterally on this kind of horseshoe shape right here if i split that horseshoe in half right here and move to the lateral side that's the lateral head of the triceps right there the long head right there and then the medial head is easiest to palpate on this distal and medial side. So just underneath the long head of the triceps, um, sitting underneath it against the humerus, we have the medial head of the triceps and that's all that right there. Okay, those all converge with, to form the triceps tendon and attach to the olecranon process right there. Not too far from that, we have the anconius muscle. This is a really tiny muscle, but it's a, an elbow extensor. So if the patient gives me a little bit of active elbow extension, I've got the medial epicon or sorry, the lateral epicondyle of the humerus right there, and the olecranon process of the ulna. And between those two, that little bubble of muscle right there is the anconius muscle. So go ahead and relax. And there it is right there. Now go ahead and contract again. And there's that anconius running between the lateral epicondyle and the olecranon process right there. Okay, next we have the brachialis muscle. So the brachialis muscle is a little more difficult to palpate. It's an elbow flexor that sits underneath the biceps brachii and covers most of the anterior surface of the shaft of the humerus right here. So we may be able to palpate it uh, medially right here if we just reflect that biceps muscle out of the way a little bit and get onto the shaft of the ulna. Um, one thing we may want to do is turn the patient's wrist into neutral or even into pronation and then have and then resist some flexion. That'll actually help take out some of that bicep because the bicep you can see as he as he supinates the forearm that bicep activates a lot more. So it's a supinator and an elbow flexor. So if we pronate the forearm that helps to take out some of that bicep and then resist some flexion and we can get under there and try to palpate that brachialis. You can also palpate the brachialis from the lateral side between the biceps and that lateral head of the triceps. So if he contracts again right there, then here's the biceps muscle, here's the triceps muscle, just between those two, I can actually feel that brachialis muscle uh, overlaying the lateral humerus right there. Okay, the next muscle we have is the brachioradialis. So the brachioradialis crosses the elbow and uh, attaches right at that supracondylar ridge and then goes down all the way and inserts on the styloid process of the radius. So in neutral wrist pronation supination, we can give a little bit of resistance here and you can see that muscle activate right there and contract right there. So we can follow that all the way down um, all the way to where it becomes its tendon and follow it all the way to that radial styloid process down there. Okay, if we look at the lateral forearm just below that uh, brachioradialis muscle, so go ahead and activate that for me here. Just below that brachioradialis muscle, we have the forearm extensor muscle. So we have the brachioradialis first, then the extensor carpi radialis longus, the extensor carpi radialis brevis, the extensor digitorum, and then a little bit further down, we have uh, the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon. So we're going to walk through those right now. If he uh, does wrist extension right here, we can see this big bubble right here pop out. That's the extensor carpi radialis longus. And the brevis sits just really close to that. So extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis right there. And we can follow those muscle bellies down the forearm. And we can really feel their tendons as they cross the wrist right here with the longus going to the base of the second meta metacarpal and the brevis going to the base of the third metacarpal. Next, we'll look at the extensor digitorum muscle. So if I have Dr. Stevenson flex his wrist and then extend his fingers, that'll selectively activate that extensor digitorum muscle. And that sits right underneath the extensor carpi radialis brevis muscle. So uh, the, re the reason we flex the wrist is that helps take out the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis, and that selectively activates the extensor digitorum muscle by uh, extending the fingers. So as he extends the fingers, I can actually feel that muscle belly right in the middle of the forearm, and I can follow that muscle belly all the way up to just above that uh, lateral epicondyle and follow it all the way down 
and follow those tendons across the wrist. And then we can see those tendons fan out uh, to each digit as it crosses the wrist right there. Okay, lastly, we have the extensor carpi ulnaris. So as, as Dr. Stevenson extends the wrist and performs some ulnar deviation, we can see the tendon of that extensor carpi ulnaris contract right there. Do it one more time. You can see that tendon really contract. And if we just follow the shaft of the ulna and come on this posterior side, we can follow that muscle belly all the way up to its attachment at the lateral epicondyle there. So this one sits right on top of the ulna and uh, when it contracts, it contracts very hard and it's kind of a thin muscle. So it almost feels like you're palpating the ulna, but if you give it a little bit of pressure, you should be able to feel that muscular end feel and then feel as it becomes the tendon and crosses the wrist into the base of that fifth metacarpal bone right there. Okay, just a few muscles of the anterior forearm right here. These are all coming off of the medial epicondyle right here and crossing over into the anterior forearm and down to the wrist. So the first one we're gonna look at is the pronator teres. So that comes off this medial epicondyle and comes to the radius over here. And when it contracts, it pulls the radius over the top of the ulna like that. So I'm gonna have Dr. Stevenson pronate. And right here, you should see a muscle belly contract right here and it becomes really taut when it contracts. So uh, we can palpate that muscle belly just distal to that medial epicondyle. Next, we have the flexor carpi radialis coming down from the medial epicondyle and crossing the wrist here. So if I have Dr. Stevenson flex the wrist, um, we can see that muscle belly contract right here and we can see the tendon contract and it's just about in the middle of the forearm and the wrist right here. So if I get on top of the radius right here and just move medially, I'll bump right into the edge of that flexor carpi radialis tendon. Okay, next we have the palmaris longus. That contracts the palmar aponeurosis here. So if I have Dr. Stevenson do this and bring those fingers together and come into some flexion, um, a lot of people don't have this muscle, but I can feel Dr. Stevenson's right there as it crosses the wrist. And then uh, more medially, we have the flexor carpi ulnaris tendon, and you can see that tendon contract right there. Go ahead and relax and contract one more time. So that tendon contracts right there, and it runs all the way up to that medial epicondyle. So a little trick right here, if I palpate the shaft of the ulna all the way down, I, I get a nice bony end feel all the way down with very little soft tissue covering. So this is a nice way to differentiate between the flexor carpi ulnaris and the extensor carpi ulnaris. If I've found that shaft of the ulna and move just anteriorly, then I'll be right on top of the flexor carpi ulnaris. And if I move posteriorly, then I'll be right on top of the uh, extensor carpi ulnaris. So with the flexor carpi ulnaris, if I wanted to selectively activate that, I'll have Dr. Stevenson do wrist flexion and a little bit of ulnar deviation, and that should contract that muscle and you can feel that muscle belly all the way up.